Okay, everybody can hear me? Perfect. Can I ask you just to stand up for one moment? It's uh, just post lunchtime. Let's stretch. <laughs> Perfect. That's what I like. All right. So thank you very much for coming, even though it's uh, 3 o'clock, uh, almost uh, 3.15 in, in Barcelona. That's like really in the middle of, of lunchtime. Um, today we have venture capital on, on stage. And um, before uh, we go and uh, have this uh, fantastic uh, people uh, speaking to you, I'll just give you a very short introduction. My name is Christopher Pomeraining, uh, very long and complicated name. Uh, I'm one of the founding partners uh, of Active Venture Partners. We are uh, based actually here in Barcelona, one of the few venture capital companies uh, actually that operate out of uh, Barcelona, out of Spain, uh, and have an international viewpoint. And uh, we like to invest in disruptive entrepreneurs um, and that are in the, in the early stage. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll be able to talk to you later on. Uh, we do investments between um, half a million euros and uh, five million euros typically. Um, and mobile is one of our preferred spaces, okay? So that much for myself, but I think now I leave the stage to you guys. And just to make a very quick introduction, uh, we have actually uh, Gilad uh, coming uh, from Horizons Venture. Uh, Gilad is actually from Israel. Um, then Michael uh, from Samsung Ventures, um, Korea. Um, then we have actually Eric, uh, Intel. Intel Capital uh, from the US, and then James, uh, a British from London, uh, from Bolton Capital. And I think it's great because you can see we have like people from like all around the world uh, just came here today uh, to Barcelona to talk to you guys. So, Gilad, why don't you give us a little uh, intro towards Horizon Ventures and yourself? Sure, absolutely. So. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gilad Novik, and I'm the CTO of Horizon Ventures. Horizon Ventures is the private investment arm of Mr. Li Kashin. Li Kashin is one of the richest guy in Asia. I believe he's number eight in the world. And the nice story about Mr. Li is that he decided a few years back that he's going to contribute a third of his wealth to the benefit of the world. And he established an organization called the Li Kashin Foundation. Uh, who philanthropically support uh, health and educational projects all over the world. Horizon Venture is kind of a vehicle to create money for the Likashin Foundation. So any money that Mr. Lee makes in Horizon Ventures, he put into the Likashin Foundation. Horizon Ventures need to be profitable. So we try to actually be very successful as much as we can. Uh, a little bit about our focus. So we tend to invest in early stage companies. We see ourselves like late angels, early stage investors. And uh, we invest in technologies in the fields of internet and mobile, which we believe that we can contribute to these companies. And some of our investments are companies like Facebook, Spotify, Second Market. One of, some of the exits that we had are companies like Siri, Waze, Onavo, Soundly, DeepMind, and few others. What we tend to look for is companies which are disruptive with a deep technology and uh, something that's gonna make a big difference in our lives. A little bit about myself, so I've been with the fund for the past four years. Before that, I was the head of innovation research for the Hutchison Group, uh, was based in London, and before that, uh, in Orange as well. Well, actually, just one, one little yeah. thing which I really like is actually you're the CTO no, of uh, Horizons Venture. So that's, well, that's, that's, that's the official title. I, I actually I have another title called the CEO, which is the, the, the chief event officer. So I, <laughs> entertainment officer. Which is the <laughs> exactly. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, yes, my, my background is mostly technology background, uh, but uh, with some understanding on business. A little bit. Perfect. My name is Michael Jian. I'm uh, currently the head of Samsung Ventures Europe, operating based out of uh, London, UK, uh, managing European investments on behalf of Samsung. Uh, Samsung Ventures, obviously, as its name suggests, um, is a venture capital investment arm on behalf of the entire Samsung group, 
Currently, we're globally managing assets of about $1.2 billion across many different funds. And, um, you know, we, we invest as early as in Series A opportunities or, or the first institutional rounds for, for, the particular, for the particular companies that we invest in, all the way to late stage growth capital type of opportunities. Um, we obviously invest in areas um, that are highly relevant to, to what Samsung does and, and Samsung's core businesses, which include um, mobile, digital media, display technologies, software, imaging technologies, and certain specific areas within medical and, and clean tech. Um, we have uh, more than 40 people across the world uh, with our HQ in Seoul, Korea. Um, and offices uh, in the United States, both in Silicon Valley as well as in Boston, um, in London, Tokyo, and soon this year in Tel Aviv uh, and, and in Beijing. Um, personally, before I came here four years ago to set up Samsung Ventures Europe, I was with Samsung Ventures US office in Silicon Valley, um, but I lived in many different parts of the world, including Korea, uh, US, uh, Australia, etc. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric Jorgensen. I'm a director with Intel Capital, and I'm based in London. Um, Intel Capital is the venture capital arm of Intel Corp. Uh, you know, sort of as, as Michael alluded to, uh, we're a corporate venture capital group. Uh, we invest money on uh, behalf of Intel shareholders in companies that we see as being uh, strategically relevant and financially interesting for Intel. Uh, if you were to split us out from Intel, we would probably be one of the largest, most global investors on the planet. We have people on practically every continent and we invest between 350 and 500 million dollars every year in really innovative startup companies. I'd say uh, our sweet spot in terms of investing are, is Series B companies. Uh, I would characterize this as companies with uh, some initial revenues, uh, complete teams, and a finished product, but are looking for, for money to expand globally. That's really where, where we're best at. We can, we can certainly invest earlier and we can invest later, but we found that you know, sort of the most value we add to companies is really at that sort of, you know, sort of expansion level where, where people need capital to, to go out and conquer the rest of the world. Great, I'm James Wise with Bolton Capital. So I think we're in an institutional venture capital fund in the more traditional sense of the word. Uh, initially started as Benchmark Europe um, and sort of rebranded to really just focus on Europe in 2008. And I think we're the largest Europe only, sort of Europe dedicated uh, venture fund in the Series A space. So while we do do investments of, uh, of anywhere from a few hundred thousand dollars up to sort of 20, 30 million dollars, our real focus is on Series A, which is capital which helps people with um, early traction, early understanding of what they're doing uh, grow nationally uh, across Europe and ultimately uh, internationally. Uh, and our team, sort of nine of us on the investment team, have all had experience either building technology companies ourselves or, or working in some of the largest technology companies in the world, uh, from individuals who built and sold sort of billion dollar software companies to representatives from Google and Yahoo and just about every other sort of blue chip tech player. Um, we're probably software focused. 80% of our investments are probably software uh, and 20% more hardware. Um, and sort of in terms of the, the similar split historically between sort of uh, web and mobile, but that's changing so quickly in the gray as of that definition is changing so quickly that we've sort of got rid of the idea of individual different types of platforms or tags and also the idea of sort of seed or series um, because those areas of them are melding so quickly that we like to see ourselves as the guys who, who help you grow uh, from an early stage at national level internationally. So if you say largest uh, like independent VC firm in Europe, what like fund size? What yeah, do you mean? Is that, <laughs> yeah. Uh, lots of qualifiers there. Uh, so we're just over two billion dollars of funds uh, dedicated just to Europe. Two billion? Uh, yeah, over two billion dollars. Okay. So can I just wrap up two billion? You have, I mean, it's difficult for you to say how much you. Uh, it's it's in, oh. the in the tens ultimately, yeah, tens of billions. Tens of billions, okay, 1.2 billion right there, yeah, and I, then I, that's probably a uh, let's say undisclosed number, undisclosed number, undisclosed number but <laughs> okay, so but it's, it's not how big you are, it's how you use it. Remember. Exactly, there we go, perfect. But anyway, I think for, for you, just, you know, just to understand, we have uh, somewhere between, well, whatever uh, the tens of billions <laughs> means, but we have between 10 billion and uh, much more here in, in front of you. And I think it's, uh, you know, f for everybody interesting to, to maybe chat to you later on uh, for investment opportunities. But let's go into maybe some, some topics. The, the, the general idea of, uh, of today is obviously speaking about uh, the next uh, mobile uh, investment trends. Uh, but um, 
maybe uh, you know we just had uh, Jan here from WhatsApp. I don't know if uh, uh, some of you guys have seen his uh, uh, intervention with uh, with Martin. Uh, I think he had a birthday party yesterday, uh, so uh, he was still I think uh, a little bit thinking of that. Uh, but so. I mean, obviously, between birthday and uh, selling a company for uh, 16 billion, um, I mean, honestly, we have to discuss it just for a minute or two. So, what, what's I mean, what's 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 up with with WhatsApp? Um, what is the what's the real deal? Uh, what does um, what does uh, Mark Zuckerberg want to do with it in, in your viewpoint? I don't want to talk for Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I think there's a couple of things that that purchase really cements uh, and should certainly cement in, in, in the, both the investor's mind, but obviously more importantly in the entrepreneur's mind. And one of those things is uh, the scale you can get to with a great product. I mean, 450 or now it's 465 million and that's rising daily users and, and quite regular users in my understanding of a product. To get to that scale was, was almost impossible sort of 10 years ago. And to do that, um, uh, at, at such speed as a result of the platforms that have been built and predominantly mobile platforms is, is sort of incredibly impressive and just another data point on, on the list of reasons why mobile investments are so important. And I think the second thing it, it sort of it screams and, and once again cements is just how important mobile is as a platform um, that Facebook is willing to give up 10% of its overall value, if not slightly more, uh, to get uh, hold of a product with not just a great team of engineers and, and, and a great brand, but more importantly, presence on so many people's phones. Uh, so those are the two big takeaways that I had. I mean, they were trends that we were all aware of, but I think it puts a price tag around those trends to just show us how important they are. To add to that, I think is the engagement that actually made them make a decision to acquire them. And you, you can look at WhatsApp and see how many times a day people actually use WhatsApp. And that's unbelievable. And that's something that uh, Facebook wanted to add to uh, its portfolio of uh, features. That's my take. Yeah, I'd say one of the things they always got you know, beaten up on since the IPO is you know, what's their mobile strategy? And so this, you know, this is just another step in sort of cementing you know, Facebook's mobile strategy. And you can, you can then, if you layer on things like gaming onto the, onto the chat piece, I mean, I think um, you know, Kakao Talk, some of these other guys have done a very good job, not as growing as quickly, but sort of you know, monetizing users better. Right, I think I think you're going to see a lot of additions that Facebook is going to layer on the chat that are going to be really interesting in terms of monetizing, you know, all those users. Can't really comment too much on somebody else's transaction that we weren't <laughs> really a part of, but I, you know, to be honest, you know, maybe to be a little bit controversial. I mean, it was a jaw-dropping number for us, and and I, maybe we were jealous that we weren't <laughs> part of the um, the whole deal process, but. Um, you know, talking about Kakao Talk, that was one of the you know really most successful Korean messaging companies, and we think that this just shows us how sort of you know uh, as a global company, Samsung, somebody like us can can take um, uh, a company like Kakao Talk, let's say, to uh, more on a more global stage and grow it to be like some, something like WhatsApp in the future. So I think there are a lot of opportunities from a global perspective for us. Um, but, but I think the jury's still out there, I want to say, that, uh, that whether the price was uh, <laughs> justified. So what, what I, I don't know if you, if you have this graph in, in, in your minds, but what I was really impressed by was that I think Facebook, oh no, Twitter, I think it took them five years no, to grow to about 50 million uh, users. Facebook was, I think, at five years at around 100 million. And, and they were at 500 million. No? I think that's really impressive. So what, does this suggest that actually growth on mobile in general is just um, through smartphones everywhere in, in different geographics where actually computers will probably never, you know, never hit? Is this suggesting that we'll see something amazing, uh, you know, just demographic-wise? Yeah, I, I think there's, I mean, there's no doubt that Growth on mobile is great for products more suited to mobile. Right? There still must be a distinction made between sort of some perhaps more enterprise products or, or, or uh, processor-heavy products and services and, and sort of mobile platform-orientated goods. But certainly, I mean, yeah, it shows that you can very, very quickly build a huge and, and uh, highly used business. The worry, uh, I think, that 
um, a lot of people have for the size of that investment is sort of making sure there's a barrier there because the other thing that we've learned from mobile investments is just as quickly as people download an app and have it on their front screen, they'll also take it off their phone pretty quickly. And in fact, you know, trying to get rid of a subscription from a SaaS platform is actually more difficult than uninstalling an app. Uh, and so while the barriers to sort of growth have been knocked down by mobile platforms phenomenally, um, the rake that people can take on those platforms, so stopping your monetization, and the ease of removal of that service is something people need to be aware of as well as the speed of growth. I agree. I mean, um, you know, we were just talking to a few mobile gaming companies this morning. Um, the stats are uh, that some 60% of all apps get, get installed and deleted within the first day. Um, so, I mean, that just shows how, how difficult it is still uh, to be able to, to create success uh, out of your venture or out of your uh, application that, that, that you develop. Um, but I think, I don't know, um, there's something else that, that we're talking about these days, both internally at Samsung as well as, um, you know, within our community is Internet of Things. So we think that that's going to be sort of uh, the next platform or the next thing um, that's going to be uh, that's going to provide um, a lot of exciting growth. Um, I hate the term IoT. Uh, it's like augmented reality or small cells. It doesn't really mean much. It's not very specific. But nevertheless, um, some of the things uh, related to IoT are, are very exciting. We're looking at um, new communications platforms, uh, new processing platforms, um, new types of hardware platforms. Wearable being one um, as being the next growth growth engines for us. So, so, okay, you just mentioned Internet of Things. I mean, so if I go back home and I try to explain my mother what is Internet of Things, I mean, maybe in your words, how, how, how would you put that? I mean, it's, as, you know, it's Internet of Things, you know, things that are connected. I think, you know, um, one of the theses that we have is that, you know, today uh, mobile phones are going to be, um, you know, the first things that are Internet of Things. And then if you believe in that, naturally, the extension of that is that um, all all things that are portable or mobile or even that are fixed um, will be able to communicate with, with each other. And then, um, you know, the, the extension to that is that, um, you know, your, your smartphones are not just smartphones, but, uh, you know, smart things that, that can all, uh, almost be the extension of yourself. So then um, it should be able to do, ultimately, uh, some of the things that human beings can do, you know, think, process, remember, communicate, um, entertain, uh, keep yourself entertained, et cetera, et cetera, to, to a um, reasonable capacity. Um, and, and so if, if we dig down one step down, um, things that relate to those sort of verbs or actions like sensing, um, communicating, uh, entertaining, which goes back to gaming, um, are the things that we're looking at today in terms of investment opportunities. Okay, so then let me just maybe rephrase because, so you say like things are interconnected, but then I take, for example, Samsung product, which is the, like the, you know, the, the gear, and then you have the watch and the, you know, what you have there. But, so there are Internet of Things or are there wearables? So just to... I mean, from an investment standpoint, Samsung Ventures point of view, Internet of Things are very general things, right? Things that can communicate with each other, um, make, simple decisions on their own, um, predict what you're going to do, um, personalize recommendations and things for you, et cetera. Okay, good. What, what's your scope on, on the whole thing of Internet of Things versus ver variables? And I, think it's, I think it's all tied together, right? And I think it's Internet of Things. When you talk about the Internet, we talk about you know, this, this, this connection of nodes that are out there, right? And you know, these wearable devices and, and ultimately your phone are just turning into data capture devices. Right, you know your your phone. If you look at the number of sensors that are going into a phone, that's increasing every year. Right, this you know latest Samsung phone that's out now. The newest thing was this heart, this heart rate sensor. Mm -hmm. it has a heart rate sensor in it, and you're going to see, I think, more and more of that. And your phone is ultimately, and and if you think about it, what kids are doing today, right? They're not really you know talking on their phone, right? They are text messaging on their phone. Uh, your phone is you know, measuring how far you're walking, it's, it's going to start doing your, your health statistics and your vital signs, and that data is going to get uploaded somewhere. And so, you know, when, it, it's tough to separate wearables from the Internet of Things, because ultimately it's all going to be about, you know, data collecting devices that are, that are all interconnected at some point. And whether you wear them or whether they're static in your house, like a, like a Nest thermostat, for example, um, you know, it's all ultimately the same thing. It's just sort of, 
you know, how you use, you know, what mode you use those devices in. Exactly. I think that with all of the both wearables and, and broader IoT section, what you're really looking at here are, are points where we can capture data which give another layer of context to that data. So that you're, you know, I think when people added uh, GPRS or something to phones, I mean, that added an extra level of context to the data already there. Um, the big challenge, I think, for wearables and, and broadly Internet of Things devices is making sure that the contextual layer that you bring is actually useful. Um, so within certain niches, Heartbeats Monitor is really useful. In other niches, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, and the companies that we're really excited about is the people who can take that new level of contextual data and turn it into relevant content. That's where the real value is here. So I, I think that the, the new devices are incredibly exciting, and they do add that level. But it's sort of making sure that you can then take that data and make it relevant to people. Um, that's a really exciting bit of the Internet of Things or wearables. Okay, so maybe Gilad, if you if you take your scope and, and just take the, the whole world of mobile, so what are the what are the trends? So what are the things that uh, maybe you have invested already in until now? And then where do you see where does the journey go? Maybe this year, next year. So which are the the founders and projects that you would uh, really like to you know uh, get to know in the future? Sure. So I, I will talk a little bit about some of. The success stories, so the success story like Waze, for example, and Skype. So I think it was very unique invention to find a way to connect people which actually live in, in different parts of the world and actually turn it into a small village. So the usage of Skype, you know, people communicate uh, via Skype on a day-to-day -day basis. The same thing with Waze. Uh, it's a, an application that giving people the ability to um, navigate from point A to point B in the most uh, efficient way. So that's something that I will use on a day-to-day -day basis, the same thing with Skype, the same thing with the new things that we will look at. So uh, another company that we invested in uh, called Hola, hola.org, and what they do, they speed, uh, the, the, they actually accelerate the speed of internet between five to 20 times faster just by downloading an app into your computer or your Android phone uh, and it just accelerates your phone. It's very difficult for people to adopt that kind of a technology, but one of the side features of that client is that it unblock content from different geographics around the world. So I can watch Netflix from the US, in the UK, or in Europe, or, or any, any other place. So that's something that brings me a day-to-day -day value, and those are the things that I'm actually looking uh, to find in new companies, something that will make a difference, something that people will use on a day-to-day -day basis more than once, more than twice, more than three times a day. Perfect. Michael, what's about Samsung Ventures? Um, so, I mean, Samsung's generally better known for its hardware products, but you know, from the venture side, um, we, we, when we say mobile, we take a very holistic view. So to James's point, I mean, we're very much interested in um, technologies that create um, con context-aware solutions, et cetera. And so when we talk about mobile, there's a natural extension to, to, to cloud because you, know, you can do lots of interesting things on the cloud um, based on the data that you collect from your mobile devices. And so to that extent, recently we've invested in uh, a number of natural language processing companies, um, Maluba being one. Um, we, we invested in... Um, uh, cloud slash uh, big data slash data management companies, um, one of them being Cloudant, which I'm, I'm glad to say that was, uh, was acquired yesterday by IBM. Um, and I'll, also on the, on the device side, um, you know, we continue to, uh, to focus on you know, hardware excellence and, and, and uh, great quality and, and things of that nature. And uh, we invested uh, a couple of years ago in a German company called Novaled, which made um, or makes uh, organic materials that would go into AMOLED displays. And Samsung ultimately ended up acquiring them for, for, a, for a meaningful sum, so we were very happy about that. Um, today we're looking at various sensor technologies, um, uh, context-aware, personalization technology, et cetera. So we're, we're very active. Cool. So what's uh, the Intel? Well, especially, I think, you, you had an interesting uh, uh, I would say viewpoint on, on variables. I mean, we, we didn't uh, continue on that one, but uh, what, do you think there is, I mean, 
is there room in the future for that, or how does Intel look at it? I think there definitely is room for, for wearables. I think there's a lot of hype around it today. So, you know, you have to strip away some of that when you're looking at investment opportunities. You know, how much of this is hype and how much of this is real. Um, but, but certainly going back to the, the point I made earlier about, you know, logging your data uh, and, you know, capturing this data and trying to quantify yourself, right, I think is, is a really interesting phenomenon. Um, you know, fundamentally, we're looking at, you know, technologies that make the ease of interacting with a computing device a lot easier, right? And so this, is this touches on a lot of what people said in terms of, you know, voice interaction with a computer. Um, you know, a lot of that, you know, ties into cloud technologies and artificial intelligence and everything else. And so, you know, I think you're seeing this grand convergence of all these, you know, different issues we have in mobile, you know, all coming together, right? And, and you know, this, it's almost like this Internet of Things umbrella, you know, is, is kind of, you know, finally pulling together solutions for all these, all these different problems we've had in different, you know, these, what we used to consider different verticals. It's all just coming together. So I think it's really fascinating time to be investing in, in the mobile space. But if you say hyped, I mean, I don't know, I just recall, I think yesterday, uh, for the ones that were at the competition, uh, we had one of the projects, you know, that had this, um, this helmet for motorbikers. Uh, so they create a variable for motorbikers that has in the, in the visor, kind of uh, like the jet pilots, the, the GPS, because for the motorbikers it's very dangerous not to look down uh, for, for navigation purposes. So I mean, there you have something, I think, which you know, makes so much sense, so uh, that suddenly is possible to do. I mean, so how does it, how does it fit in with saying, okay, it's, it's, it's hype, but maybe there's there are real uh, needs that can be covered. Oh yeah, for, for certain, there's no doubt. And, and you know, one of the wonderful things about technology is that it keeps getting smaller, uh, you know, better, better on battery consumption and everything else, right? So everything is driving towards you know, things we can wear, things that will be on all the time. We don't have to worry about you know, switching them off at night or plugging them in you know, every few hours. So you know, technology is driving towards you know, this ubiquitous computing that you know, does tie into the wearable space. The, the problem is you, know, you open a newspaper today and you know, every other company is now coming out with a wearable strategy and doing this and doing that. And, and so you know, while there's certainly going to be some great point opportunities right now, I think it's just so in the forefront of the press's mind that we're just hearing about it all the time. And you, know, you start to be a little jaded when every day you read a new article about this company that's coming out, you know, that's adopting and they're changing from being a mobile company to being a wearable company. But yeah, their strategy is the same, right? They've just kind of changed the name of what they're doing. So, so. so what's then out there, which is not in the news all the time, but which is really, I mean, really sexy and hot? See, I can uh, tell you, but then I'd have to kill you, right? Uh, come on. <laughs> so. give, us, uh, give us some, well, just uh, one of your, your secret hot sectors. So, so I, you know, I, and, and I'm you know, sort of repeating myself again, right, but this ability to log your data, right, log data about yourself. So, you know, there are companies out there that are developing sensors that let you, you know, not only manage or not only track your heart rate, but, you know, check things like your blood pressure, your, your blood oxygen rate and things like that. So, so I think, you know, combining health data into, into what we're doing on an everyday basis so we sort of understand, you know, how we're feeling, you know, how healthy we are, um, I think is a really exciting trend. And so there's some companies out there that are doing some really neat, neat stuff around that. M Health, is that for you? Yeah, I, mean, I think health and education are two of the areas that we've been exploring uh, sort of for the last, well, since we started, but in the last few years have really changed. I think that the big step and a sort of a, a common theme that maybe has come out is, and I, I always get this quote wrong from Ev Williams, but it's one of my favorite, so I shouldn't, um, which is you know, help people do what they do anyway and make it easier. Uh, and I think the big shift that we're seeing in mobile and, and mobile connected devices and Internet of Things is, Right now, people are allowing you to do things you previously couldn't do, so track your heartbeat and everything else, but actually that's not what's interesting for everyone. What most people want to do and what they do anyway is they diet uh, or they work out. So use that information to help them do that more. Don't try and make them adopt a new behavior, which is you know, at the moment how a lot of uh, IoT things are developing. I, I, I want to drive my motorbike more safely and more fun, um, so help me do that. Don't build a, a fighter pilot headset that I probably don't need, give me the stuff that's relevant for me to do what I want to do anyway. Um, and I think it's that mental shift that I think is really, really important when you start thinking about sort of the next generation of, of uh, services that come out either through mobile or, or smarter devices. 
Um, for us, uh, you know, historically, a lot of our investments in the mobile space have been uh, gaming. We, we had an excerpt a couple of weeks ago of Natural Motion, which is uh, one of the most advanced 3D gaming um, software services, which you know, sort of Zynga, um, and sort of lots of investments like Wooga in that space. Uh, but increasingly, that strategy is changing. Uh, we've been looking at e-commerce and have lots of investments in e-commerce platforms, which are now seeing mobile as, as their uh, the entry point, the tablet is the entry point into the e-commerce um, funnel, uh, and how you, how do you adapt to that? And now we've started looking at uh, platforms which take it to another level. So companies like Touch Surgery, which are actually educating doctors um, through mobile devices, through tablet devices, at point of need, uh, which is just taking uh, the idea of health and education and, and bring it to another level um, to have it at your fingertips and relevant to you. Now the big mental step that you have to make there is understanding. People do not want to change their workflow. People don't want to change rapidly how, how, they, how they live and act every day. What they want to do is have these devices to enable them to do it easier. Uh, and I think that's the, that's the thing that we look for in the investments that we're making and in the sectors that we're making at the moment, understanding how these new technologies will make things easier. Okay, so now thinking about that's kind of some of the future trends, is there something where you say that has been a trend and it's I mean, not at all anymore a trend, maybe to give also, I mean, a hint out there? I, I get very tired of seeing mobile payments companies. So, because seem, they seem to be everywhere and everybody you know, seems to be saying they do this. Uh, it's really tough to see the differentiation. So, for those of you out there raising money and you're a mobile payments company, please come to me and tell me what, you know, why you're different than everybody else because a lot of these things seem the same and, and I think that was a, you know, a big investment trend you know, the last few years, and I think that's, that's one that's, you know, probably going to be on the wane going forward. And it's just because of differentiation, or is it because there's also forces being, I don't know, financial institutions or whatever that uh, basically mingle up and do their, their own thing? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's a market distortion. I think it's mainly about, you know, there, there, there are very, it seems to be very few barriers to entry and, and not a lot of differentiation among the companies that are doing this. Okay. Any other, let's say, not yeah. so, you know, sexy trends? Yeah, well, I, I mean, just to, to be relatively controversial on the topic of this discussion, future of mobile investment, I think the biggest trend I've seen recently is that the idea of mobile at, at VWeb is gone. Um, so we don't really look at mobile investments anymore. We look at investments in, in various different sectors. Um, but whereas, say, a few years ago, the natural question would be, are you mobile first, or are you web first, are you, you, know, you going to be iOS first or Android? I think those questions are slowly dissolving. And the concept of mobile as a separate platform is, is, is going as well. I actually did, before I came here, we do a, a run of tags on angel lists. So we just look at angel lists, which is a, a sort of online tool for startups um, to raise capital, and we pulled all of the tags. And I think last month was one of the first months where the number of startups and angel lists describing themselves as mobile actually fell. And this has been rising and rising and rising. In San Francisco, you know, I think it's eight out of 10 startups call themselves mobile. But that tag's starting to fall because the idea of, of separating them out has kind of become meaningless. If you are going to be a software-based service or even a hardware-based service now, you have to be mobile. So why pull it out as a distinction? Perfect. What's your scope on not so I mean, like fading out trends. Fading out? Um, well, you might, I don't know how everybody else feels here, but you might think that gaming might be one of these, you know, overbeaten um, areas. But we, um, and, and even though we have not done much investments in, in the gaming space, I actually think that it's still very exciting and, and it's something that's very interesting to, to keep our eyes on because um, as the generation of, of these highly, socially connected, you know, digitally uh, connected um, generation grows up, I think, you know, you have a very wide and broad set of relationships with your acquaintances, but they're probably more shallow than, than your, 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 you know, the traditional relationships that you've, you've had in the past. And so I think, um, inevitably, I think, you know, you're, you're going to be a little more lonely, actually, in, in, in the physical sense. And so I think there has to be some digital means of, of keeping you entertained or keeping you sort of company, whether it's, it's um, you know, using some kind of, uh, an, you know, a standalone game or, or through, through your digital networks, um, you know, gaming with each other. So I think gaming is something that, that we want to continue to look into. Um, secondly, um, uh, so sorry. So you were very political there. So you said gaming, no, but yes. That's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, and secondly, uh, something that we're looking at today that, that we think is very exciting is indoor positioning and indoor location, um, especially with you know, all, all the keywords out there. Um, and so I, you know, I, I think there are, there's a ton of new innovation opportunities, new technologies that can be spun out of uh, indoor positioning, new business models and, and value propositions. Um, and then not to, not to bore the other, other panelists to death, but um, uh, if you think that Internet of Things and wearable devices are sort of the next set of things that can be in the hundreds of millions in, in units, um, if not billions, then, then that starts to be very um, interesting and we want to look at the underlying enabling technologies uh, enab enabling those, right, platforms, um, perhaps new set of communication chips or processing um, components, et cetera. So I, I think and I hope that um, that sort of can reignite and reactivate um, you know, investors' interest in, in putting uh, investments in, into, into the hardware space. Thank you. Shilat, what do you, what do you see as, as something that you know, maybe today you would say, okay, maybe we, we should refocus your, uh, your pitch? So I think I see quite a lot of companies doing contextual understanding uh, in order to try and filter the internet. And yes, that's something that definitely needed for mobile phones, but there are so many variations for the same thing. And it's not that clear what the uniqueness and what, what, what is that edge and value that they bring to the consumer. And that's something that I would suggest to companies to look uh, in a wider kind of a picture to see what, what is the bigger value that they can bring to uh, the consumers at the end of the day. It's, it seems like it's kind of different implementation of the same thing in different companies and, and that's something that I've, I've seen too much in, in the past few months, past year. Okay, so maybe we have some, uh, you know, mobile payment uh, founders uh, and gaming founders in the audience. <laughs> so I think we have a microphone uh, somewhere right there. So I think it's time for question and answer. Okay, please hit us hard. <laughs> oh, I thought you were asking if there's any mobile gaming companies. Yeah. But I already came up with a question. And is what is your uh, latest investment and why did you invest in that person? Less investment? Your Maybe. last investment. My last investment. So uh, my last investment is actually on a seed investment in San Francisco, a company called uh, Human, and what they do, they created a, a very interesting address book. We changed the all interaction between uh, your contacts based on your location, based on the time of the day, uh, and other aspects of, of yourself. And, and that's a very interesting concept, how to actually bring you relevant content on any given time. and because of the good team did you invest in, in human? So it's a combination, definitely the team, definitely the vision uh, and uh, the opportunities that that type of a technology can bring in the future. Cool. Anybody else? Some really exciting last investment? Um, well, the last investment I think we made was actually in a mobile uh, travel app, but it's not public yet, but it's definitely in the mobile space. and. Uh, you know, there's a couple of things that I think we look for. It's a good question if you're raising capital, especially if, you, if you're in, in mobile platforms. Um, one of the things that interests me most is actually something that, that Jalad said and, and explained quite well. Uh, and one piece of advice I give what we, that we look for quite a lot is it's not actually any more about 100,000 apps in 100 countries, you know, downloads, sorry, 100,000 downloads in 100 countries. I'm not sure if that's as exciting as saying we've got 10,000 downloads, but we've found a way to make these people use us every day and we've built something with real value. Uh, in just the same way, it's not, it's not yet, at least I don't feel about um, saying we found the perfect way to monetize when you're looking for early stage capital or series A. It's about finding um, a way to say that we've built something people want to use. We built something people find valuable because ultimately if you build something that people find valuable on a daily basis, and I think as you know, um, the WhatsApp founders will, will agree, you will find ways to, to, to monetize, you'll find ways to, to find value from that. Um, so the key, the key metrics when we look at investments really are about have you really built something that people want and, and enjoy and use regularly? Uh, that's what we really look for and sort of we've made a few investments in that space recently. Okay, another question? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Ali, I'm from Egypt. Uh, I have a question for all the investors here. Uh, how, how I mean, do you have future plans to look into uh, the Middle East uh, 
and the Arab world as uh, as investment. Yes. Yeah, Bedouin Shaka, Bibi. No, so so Intel Capital, I, I mentioned earlier, we're we're, we're a truly a global organization. So uh, we've had people. Uh, we actually currently have an office in in Nigeria, and we have someone in in Turkey. And, and between the two of them, they cover sort of, uh, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and so we've made a number of investments. I don't have the number off the top of my head. Um, I don't think we've done any VC deals in, uh, in Egypt to date, uh, but we certainly have done some in the, in the Gulf region. So uh, we, think it's, we think it's an interesting area. Uh, if you look at, you know, talking about mobile, sort of the, the amount of, of, of Facebook users in, in these developing markets, um, I think it's, it's really fascinating, the growth. So there are definitely some good opportunities for pursued there. And there are not a lot of good VCs out there. So I think, I think you can find some great opportunities if, if you take the time and go look. Yeah, what's any, any scope? So I, mean? I, I think uh, with us, we, we work globally. So it's not, we are not blocked for one part of the world on the other. So we've got investments in Asia, in Europe, America, and the Middle East as well some other parts of the Middle East. But uh, yes, we're open to any uh, interesting company all over the world. I think you mentioned already Europe anyway. And, uh, yeah, but we work with founders uh, across the world. And, and so we have companies based across the world. I think what we, sorry, companies which currently operate across the world. What we look for just because we, we try and have as much of a personal relationship as possible on a mentorship level. We, we try and I hope that people are in Europe because that means that we can, we can connect with them more regularly. But yeah, so as a result, we're mostly invested in European started companies, but then you know, global companies operate globally, so we're happy to back them to get there. Okay. Well, well, I mean, we operate globally as well. We have people all over the world. Um, I think what's important is, is that we're not necessarily investing in companies that are targeting their own domestic markets and try to be big in that, in that domestic market but rather companies that have, um, that can sort of, from our strategic perspective, that can um, you know, provide their technologies or, or products um, that can be integrated somehow with, with the Samsung platform and, and be a global company. Perfect, you know? okay. So um, I think last question, very fast. Um, I think we have our next panel coming up. Um, so to welcome our next panelists, I think from our viewpoint as venture capitalists, what do we think of accelerators? Just to you know, spice up a little bit the air. Um, is I mean, you know, what's what's up? I mean, we are seeing accelerators popping up every month, um, everywhere in the world. Uh, is there? I mean, are they useful? Is it? Uh, what, what's going to happen? Just from our viewpoint of view. I think they, they, they can be useful. We've invested in, in, in a hand, very small number of companies which have come out of the bigger accelerators. Uh, the one piece of advice I'd give you if, you were, if you're joining them is, is making sure that you keep your own independent viewpoints at all times. Um, so work out if they're really necessary, because sometimes they definitely are, but they're not necessary for everyone, which is also true for venture capital, by the way. It isn't for everyone. You don't need it. Uh, but also making sure that you keep an independent viewpoint throughout the entire process while taking what you can from the many benefits they offer. Okay, any, any very strong view point? No, I'd say it's, it's a business deal, so act accordingly, right? Make sure that you're getting you know, out of it what you put into it, or more, hopefully, um, and that the quality of some of the accelerators can really vary tremendously, so you know, don't be afraid to do your homework. And that, that applies to taking venture capital. Um, it's, it's very rare that someone I'm investing in does reference calls on me, which I think is ridiculous, right? <laughs> I'm giving you, you know, a lot of money and we're establishing a relationship together. Do your homework on me because I'm doing my homework on you. So, so just bear that in mind too as, as you're going out there in the world. Well, we've obviously noticed a trend. And so what do we do at Samsung? Um, we created an accelerator on our own. <laughs> so, so we've got a couple of hundred million dollars allocated for that. So come to us as well. <laughs> Perfect. Do that any... You are happy with accelerators? I'm happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with good, good companies coming out of the accelerators. Perfect. Okay, so these guys, they will probably be around behind the stage if you have uh, some questions. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Michael.